Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the bill. To the bill. Desperate times call for desperate measures. That's a slogan that people have used for generations, and I think it's a slogan that they've used to make bad choices. And this, I believe, could be one of those bad choices. There are a lot of things that I will agree with that have been said today. We have serious issues. In fact, to say we have housing issues really doesn't do it justice. We have a major housing problem in our state, and we have heard hours upon hours of testimony about that. And I'll give you, I'll give you that one. We have a problem with rising and rapidly rising rent prices. I agree with that as well. And we have a problem with some bad actor landlords. I'll give you that. But if we operate with the notion that desperate times require desperate measures, and if we, as my, I believe that this bill is a desperate measure, if we take extreme policies to deal with those desperate measures, then we're going to do more damage than we intend to. Actually, hopefully we don't intend to do any damage, but we're going to damage things without realizing it. So, a few th issues that I have with this bill. Okay, we've had a lot of good conversations, but there's a few things that haven't necessarily been mentioned. And one of those is that this is, this is bad contract law. This came out, in, and I actually had some advocates after the last hearing with the amendment that came to talk to me about this. The idea of a contract, anyone who writes a good contract knows that at some point that contract should come to a conclusion because perpetuity is a long time. But the amendments that we added into this bill, what they do is they say at the end of a fixed term agreement, so at the end of your lease, the, the tenant can be allowed out of that, but the landlord can't and it automatically rolls over into a month to month and takes all these other things and shoves it into their face when they might be saying, hey, I've met my one year obligation, I'm ready to move on. But they don't have that option. We talk about fairness, but we're removing that part of a contract and saying, look, tenants, you can get out when you're done, it's up to you, landlords, you can't. You're stuck, no matter what your contract says. We're going to rewrite that for you. I also believe that this is bad for housing stability. We've seen throughout the nation, and we've had people talk about rent control practices throughout the nation, but here's the simple thing. If you increase or decrease stability for investors, if investing, if a, 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 an investment is no longer stable or unpredictable, such as what this would do if we remove the local preemptions, if we allow 36 counties to make their own laws, then the investors no longer have any sort of predictability as to what will happen. What's to say that in a couple weeks, in a couple months, that someone won't follow San Francisco and say a reasonable rate of return is 2.2%? And so if we remove stability for investors, then we increase instability for renters. And I think that's going to make it harder on them. But really, the issue that I'm most concerned about with all of this is that we are fracturing an already fragile relationship between landlords and tenants. If you came to our, our hearings, the, the good chair, she did a fantastic job of making sure everybody had an opportunity to speak on both sides. But you could feel the tension growing in the room. Some people re were respectful, some people were incredibly disrespectful. One of the things I found disrespectful was that some people who spent some time in this building decided they were going to circulate landlord excuse bingo and make a mockery of all the issues that the landlords did have, valid reasons. Like one of the reasons on that is I'm losing money. And that suddenly is a joke in a hearing. And you could watch as the tension increased between these two groups and some people got up with flat out hatred for the other group. And so here we are deciding, let's implement policies that are going to increase those tensions between those two groups and cause them to fight even more. I've been frustrated since 2016. In 2016, we did see that landlords and tenants could come together. And in this building, we passed some compromise bills through this building that both groups agreed on. Representative Johnson yields his time. Please continue. Thank you. I am flat out 
ashamed of what happened in the interim. Our landlord-tenant coalition that we normally run these things through, disbanded. And you know what? I sat down with people from both sides, multiple people from both sides, to say what happened, and guess what? They were both like my children when I break them up in a fight. They both say, it's their fault. It's their fault. You know what? They needed to grow up and get it together and figure out something that we could all get behind, which is what's happened historically, but that's not what's happening with this bill. And so instead, we're seeing in this desperate time that now landlords feel like they are going to have to take desperate measures. The number of calls that I've received from landlords freaking out about this because they don't know if their investment is sound anymore. Not just the no cause. That's a smaller issue to many of them. But the issue of who knows what a reasonable rate of return will be next week or next month or next year. And how can I trust my retirement to that? And so our desperate or extreme actions in this building are going to lead to desperate measures in my, or desperate measures from landlords, in my opinion. And I think that this bill, it fails in the area of good contract law. It fails to bring stability to the housing market. And it fails to bring Oregonians together in unity. And instead, it divides us. And I think it's time that this bill fails right here and right now.